All right, thank you. We'll get you to turn to your Bibles to Jeremiah in chapter 32. And just as you're doing that, I thank you for the opportunity to be here again, and uh, particularly to Pastor Steve and Angela for looking after me and driving me around and feeding me, taking good care of me. Uh, and hello to all those on Zoom land, uh, Bruce and uh, the Nansky's and Gus there again, I see, and others. In the meantime, uh, chapter 32 of Jeremiah and verse 1. And the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the 10th year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, for those who are not overly familiar with how this works, so the nation of Israel broke up into two sections. And one was called the House of Israel, which was the northern section. They had a capital called Samaria. And the southern section was called the House of Judah, with just the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, and their capital was Jerusalem. Now, earlier than this, the northern tribes had been taken by the Assyrians. And uh, what was left was hopefully people who were going to be a little bit more in tune with God. They could see what was happening to the northern section, and they would learn their lesson. And for a little while, they did but uh, they slipped back into some corrupt ways again and what we're reading here is really about the year 587 bc nebuchadnezzar was the king of babylon earlier than this in 604 bc the king of babylon had sent his armies over to the southern tribes these benjamin and judah and jerusalem and started inroads into their captivities and uh, and destruction uh, he sent some more later on, and here we are. This is the concluding stages of it. You read here in verse 2, For then the king of Babylon's army besieged Jerusalem. So these were the last days, as it were, of the southern tribes. This was the end times for Jerusalem and uh, the, those two tribes, and for Israel generally at that particular time. So this was 587 BC, and this was prophesied. And... Uh, they were being warned about this and they didn't like it just continuing in verse 2 and jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the prison well he was shut up in more ways than one the king zedekiah wanted him to shut up i don't want to hear these sort of things and then they shut him up in the prison to try and sort of stop him so we shoot the messenger he came to prophesy what was going to happen what was the end result of their disobedience and their rebellion and their corruption and not learning a lesson and they didn't like to hear this so they put him in prison which was in the king of judah's house for zedekiah the king of judah had shut him up saying wherefore do you prophesy and say thus saith the lord behold i will give this city jerusalem into the hand of the king of babylon and he shall take it and zedekiah king of judah shall be not escape out of the hand of the chaldeans but shall surely be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon and shall speak with him mouth to mouth and his eyes shall behold his eyes. So Jerusalem and the kingdom was going to be overthrown. And this is what Jeremiah was saying. And King Zedekiah didn't like it at all. Um, there was no signs of repentance. It was just simply, well, get rid of the messenger because we don't like the message. And he led and he shall lead Zedekiah. This is still the prophecy to Babylon, and there shall he be until I visit him, saith the Lord. Though you fight with the Chaldeans, you shall not prosper. So this was made very clear. This is what's going to happen. The writing was on the wall. The end result was judgment and punishment and was going to be inflicted upon the complete uh, sort of destruction almost of the, the temple and the walls and, uh, and, and Jerusalem generally, and the large numbers, thousands of people, were taken captive back to Babylon. So this was 587 BC. Well, that was going to happen. And uh, then you're in verse 6. And Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, So that's the background. The place is going to be overthrown by the enemy. All the property is going to be taken away. They're going to be in complete charge, uh, the enemy of their land. And most people will be taken away captive. And then Jeremiah gets this message. Behold, in verse 7, Hanamiel, the son of Shalom, 
thine uncle shall come unto thee, remember he's in prison, saying, buy thee my land that is in Anathoth, for the right of redemption is thine to buy it. So Hanamiel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison, according to the word of the Lord, and said unto me, buy my field, I pray thee, that is in Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin. For the right of inheritance is thine, and the redemption is thine, buy it for yourself, then I knew this was the word of the Lord. So he got this message and it was fulfilled. But how stupid is all of this? This is ridiculous. On the, on the, on the face value of all of this, what on earth would you wanting to buy some property in Jerusalem for when it's going to be in a matter of days overthrown and take, totally taken charge of? It's like buying a block of land in Gaza at the moment. <laughs> Doesn't make a lot of sense whatsoever to do such a thing. But this man was told that it defies logic. And sometimes what God does, does defy natural reasoning and natural appreciation. And uh, this man was a faithful man. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And if you're going to exercise faith, you've got to do both of those things, hear the word of God and believe it and act accordingly. And so this man said, well, okay, I was told this was going to happen. It is happening. I better do what the Bible or what God expects me of as we read in the Bible. So verse nine, and I bought the land of Hanamiel, my uncle's son, that was in Anathoth, and weighed him the money, even 17 shekels of silver. Even the number 17 gives you a bit of a clue, because in Bible numerics, that's the number of safety and security. And this is looking anything but safe and secure when you're going to have your whole property overrun and the enemy just take over and completely, you'll have no say in it whatsoever. You won't even be there. You'll be taken away captive. You probably could even be killed. And yet somehow or other, you've got to buy this land and believe that, that you're going to get some use out of it in some way or other. So he did it. And we read on, and I subscribed the evidence, verse 10, and sealed it and took witnesses and weighed him the money in the balances. So I took the evidence of the purchase, both that which was sealed according to the law and custom, and that which was open. And I gave the evidence of the purchase under Barak, the son of Neriah, the son of that person in the sight of Hanamiel, my uncle's son, and in the presence of the witnesses that subscribed the book of the purchase before all the Jews that sat in the court of the prison. Now I read that out, but it doesn't really matter, but it's rather interesting. I'm not going to spend time today because that's not what I want to do. That's not the thrust of this talk. But if you see the parallel in what's happening here, because the Lord is promising there's going to be a future regardless of what it looks like. And in the meantime, we read there's a redemption involved. There's a purchase involved. There's an inward seal and an outward seal involved. There is evidence. There's identification. And this is sealed in an earthen vessel. We even heard that in the gifts today, tonight. So this is reminding us of what Jesus Christ achieved and what he set up for us, because we have inwardly the seal of the Holy Ghost in the earthen vessel. Outwardly, we have the evidence of speaking in tongues and hopefully our life in the spirit. And this is all the guarantee, the earnest, the down payment, the deposit of the future to come. This story is about the Lord fulfilling his promises with a future. This in case involves the nation of Israel. It could involve individuals. It could involve any situation we might be dealing with. It certainly involves the overall plan and purpose of God that we have been sealed, not just for now, but for all eternity. So that's what the Lord had in mind for us, of course. If you read on, and I charge Barak before them saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take these evidences, this evidence of the purchase, both which is sealed and this evidence which is open and put them in an earthen vessel that they may continue many days. And we have this treasure, we have this seal, we have this assurance in an earthen vessel and we will continue as many days as it takes. We will make sure that we're still here when the Lord returns. But the point I want to make about all of this is really about the Lord doing things which seem to be somewhat impossible. Because on the surface of this, to buy a block of land there appears to be no purpose to it whatsoever other than God said so, because there is no future, you would think, but God promised a future. For we read in verse 15, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. 
For us, if we're thinking about the ultimate return, the Lord's coming back and he's going to take up his possession, which is us. And we're going to go to the promised land, the ultimate that the Lord has in store for us. But I also want to just see how the Lord has promised individual things for us. As we heard in the gifts of provision, as we often uh, encourage always that the Lord wants to supply every need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. His promises are yea and amen. So we read on in verse 16. Now, when I had delivered the evidence of the purchase under Barak, the son of Neariah, I prayed. Why did he pray? <laughs> because he wasn't really overly confident about all of this in the sense that it didn't make a lot of sense to him and he wondered how it was going to work. Even when we heard in the gifts tonight that sometimes the Lord is working behind the scenes, bringing about a result that we hadn't quite imagined was possible. I don't know how Jeremiah could possibly have imagined that somehow or other we're going to be overthrown, the king's going to be taken back to Babylon and he's going to be in all sorts of trouble and we're going to lose our whole territory and our kingdom. But somehow or other, we're going to possess it again. He didn't quite understand. So he prayed. And that's not a bad thing for all our times, is it? As I often said, we are strongest on our knees. And he just reminded himself, as we remind ourselves, how great God is. Verse 17, Our Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. It's a wonderful verse to remind yourselves about. I think I've mentioned many times the word behold. Have I mentioned that, Pastor Steve? The word behold. The word behold is not a word that we normally use in our English language. I don't know you probably ever use it down here in Georgia. You wouldn't drive to McDonald's and say, behold, McDonald's. Uh, <laughs> it's not the sort of way we would operate. However, it's a wonderful word in the Hebrew and in the Greek. Because what it means is stop, look, be involved, appreciate, take notice of, really take this in. This is significant. So draw, it's a word that is drawing our attention to the, the nature of what's being said here. And so we read here, behold, our Lord God, I sit up, I take notice, I appreciate, I contemplate, I recognize that there is really nothing too hard for you, even though I might be struggling a little bit and coming to grips with it and wondering how it's all going to come together, as you might be in your life about your circumstances about your healing need, about your provision, about uh, other particular things that you want to take place in your life, whatever they may be, whether it be a job or whether you're single and you want a, uh, a husband or a wife or whatever, or children or whatever. It goes on to say, Thou showest loving kindness unto thousands and recompense the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty God, the Lord of hosts, is his name great in counsel mighty in work not just in words but in doing counsel and work saying and doing for thine eyes are open upon all the ways of the sons of men the lord's eyes are upon us continually and consistently through all circumstances to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings if we're believing if we've got fervent, earnest prayer, if we're taking hold of the promises of God, they're available to us. And then it goes on. I won't read for the sake of time. Uh, it goes back over the history, a little bit of, of the nation of Israel, setting signs and wonders and so on. He goes all the way through that and talks about what's available. Then we read in verse 26. Then came the word of the Lord under Jeremiah. So who, here's the response now. I think that maybe Jeremiah is still wondering how this is all going to unfold and maybe there's a, a degree of perplexity in his mind to some degree so god says in verse 27 behold i am the lord the god of all flesh is there anything too hard for me now we've already got the restatement there there is nothing too hard for thee maybe god was saying do you really believe what you're saying do you really believe all these words you put together are you really believing as you're praying to me that, yes, I can move in such a way? Is there really anything too hard for me? Or have you put restrictions on me? Have you limited me in some way in your mind? I want to make sure you really do believe 
what I'm saying to you. And I really do believe that when I command you to, to buy a block of land or a parcel of land, that it's okay. There's a good reason for it. And I'll go to satisfy the need eventually. There won't be any drama about that ultimately. Put your trust and your confidence in me. Verse 28, therefore, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will give this city into the hand of the Chaldeans. I'll fulfill that part of it. There are consequences to bad action. And the hand of the Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, he shall take it. Yeah, all that stuff's going to happen. But if you go all the way down to the end of this chapter, you can read that for homework. The last little bit of verse 44, last sentence, for I will cause their captivity to return, saith the Lord. I'm going to do what I said I would do. And you can go through all of this stuff. And yes, and by all means, extol my virtues. Consider my great universe. Consider all the testimonies that you've had in your life. Consider about the people. Consider the miracles and wonders and signs that I've done. At the end of the day, you need to believe that I'm going to answer that prayer. Whatever that prayer is. In this case, it was buy a block of land because it's going to be an indication to you that I'm going to fulfill my promise to you that I'm going to bring you back into this situation again. Now, what happened after that? Well, they all were taken into Babylon. No doubt about that. However, uh, the Babylonians themselves were overthrown by the Medes and Persians. In October 539 BC, Cyrus the Great, heading up the Medes and Persians, overthrew uh, the uh, Babylonians, which means they took control of Israel. But a couple of years later, they allowed them to go back and start rebuilding the temple. And in the 440s BC, they allowed Nehemiah to go back to start building the wall. It just so happens that when you read the book of Nehemiah, it mentions that 128 people went back to Anathoth. Anathoth was occupied again. <coughs> that's, the place he, that's the place he bought. That's where he bought this block of land. 128 people went back. There may have been others afterwards. I've got no idea. But... Uh, just as these words were fulfilled. That was only a partial fulfillment because you know that as time went on, uh, the, the Greeks took over, then the Romans took over. And then of course, down through history until you come to 1917, when the Ottoman Empire was in control. And that happens to have been 2,520 years after the original Babylonian attack in 604 BC. That's another story I'm sure Pastor Steve has mentioned to you about the seven times punishment more than once, and that's exactly seven times 360, 604 BC, 1917. And then we've got the Israelite, the Jewish people coming back into Palestine. And then that goes over a period of time. And then in 1948, they declared them the state of Israel and all the nations attacked them. And then in 1967, they were attacked again. And in 1973, there was more attacks. And so, and they're still attacking. It's still happening today. But the nation of Israel is there and they're in that land which God said you'd come back to. It just so happens, I don't want to be political, but in Leviticus 26, it says this. And yet for all that, when they're in the land of their enemies, I will not spurn and cast them away, neither will I despise them. This is going back to Leviticus. We haven't even really got them established yet. And he's saying they're going to be cast away, but I'm going to bring them back. And I will not destroy them. I'll, I will not break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. Now, that's in Leviticus 26. And in the Amplified Bible, at the bottom of that page, where this is describing Israel coming back, we read this. No greater evidence that God keeps his word is available than the fact of the existence today of the Jews as a nation. Scattered for 25 centuries, 2,500 years plus, throughout the world with powerful forces determined to wipe them out, and I'll put in bracket, and still determined to wipe them out, yet they are restored to their homeland because in spite of all their sins against him, God refuses to break his covenant with their forefathers and with them. The presence of even a small number of Jews in the world, after all the centuries of diabolical effort to exterminate them, would alone be sufficient assurance that God will keep his promises, whether good or bad, to individuals or to nations. How true is that? We have other evidence, but the nation of Israel's existence and Jerusalem being a cup of trembling right now. And the Bible telling us to keep our eyes on Palestine and to be aware of what's going to happen in the last days. 
But the message I want to get across is not so much historical and not so much particularly about that, but that nothing is too hard for God. God did bring them back. God did fulfill his promises, and he always does all the way through. And, and uh, I want to go now to the New Testament with that thought in mind. Let's go to Romans chapter 4. There are many, many examples. We haven't got time to look at them all. Of course, Romans chapter 4. This is fairly well known. <clears throat> This is to do with Abraham. Remember, Abraham was promised to have a, a son. His son was going to be Isaac, but they were childless and didn't look like having any children. So you look at Romans chapter 4 and verse 17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. This is talking about Abraham. Before him whom he believed, even God who quickens the dead and calls those things which not as though they were. In this case, there was the deadness of Sarah's womb uh, and uh, she looked to be going to be childless and she, they tried to work it out some other way, go into uh, uh, Hagar, the Egyptian handmaiden and so on. And that caused all sorts of world problems, it turns out. Um, verse 18, who, this is Abraham, who against hope, against all natural hope, just like Jeremiah. The natural hope of Jeremiah would be, how is this possible? We are going to be totally overrun by the enemy and I am foolishly buying a block of land uh, which doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Who against hope believed in hope. So against natural hope or reason, natural human reason gone, he hoped on in faith. He believed God's word and that's what faith's all about. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God and acting on the word of God. You cannot exercise faith without hearing God's word. It's impossible. The faith of the Bible is based on God's word. And not only just hearing it, not only just believing it, but that belief initiating you doing something about it. That it might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, uh, which well, in the Amplified it said, which was good as dead. He did have children after this, we might have when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, he staggered not at the, at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Is there anything too hard for God? God is able to do all things, whatever it is that we're seeking the Lord about whether it's to do with just life in general or whether it's to do with children or whether it's to do with your own body or other things that you're contending with and whatever. The Bible's making it clear here. The only limitation is that we've got an earthen vessel and we struggle with it and we need to be built up and we need to be encouraged. We need to see what the promises are. There are many, many, many examples in the Bible, as you well know. I'm going to just read a couple of scriptures here just to sort of uh, uh, give some illustration of that. For example, in Matthew 19, it says, For with God all things are possible. First Samuel, Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the outpost of these uncircumcised Philistine fellows. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. He can save us, deliver us, whether by many or by few. So whatever the enemy might be uh, firing at us first kings this is to elijah i've commanded the ravens to feed thee so he went and did according unto the word of the lord for he went and dwelt by the brook cherith that is before jordan and the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening and he drank of the brook i don't suppose he would have thought that's possible uh, i'm not suggesting by the way some of these things are more dramatic back then to, to give us an insight that the lord can do what he is able to do for us in a, perhaps a more simpler way but he's saying here well look if need be i can bring a bird to come down and drop you some food well i, don't, I haven't seen that happen to me yet i don't know anybody else has done that but uh, uh, somewhere or other he'll do it remember elijah went to the widow woman and her son and they were about to basically eat their last meal and die uh, and he said, uh, you make me a cake first. Put God first. We heard that in the gifts too. Put God first. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. 
And then you've got this rather dramatic story. Now the Lord had prepared a great feast to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the feast three days and three nights. And many people challenge that, of course. But we can believe in miracles and we believe that somehow or other God did all of that. I don't want that particular miracle. But, as, but as, and another one in Second Kings. And here's how simple that is. Gets. Remember this guy that was actually chopping down a tree and the axe head fell off and went into the water. Oh, woe is me, he said, because I borrowed it. And that was going to be, get him into a bit of trouble. But as one was felling a beam, the axe fell into the water and cried, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him a place and he cut down a stick and cast it thither and the eye did swim. I gave a whole talk on that particular verse um, because there's a lot of stuff in there. But just from the sur surface of it, okay, the Lord's interested. We, we lost something. I mean, let's be honest. How many times have you maybe you've prayed just quietly to the Lord? Where are my keys, Lord? Uh, can you get me a parking spot? This is getting ridiculous. Um, we, we've, we've prayed to the Lord about a lot of simple things, and the Lord is able to look after our, our life in many ways. And the axe head floated and swam, which is not what they normally do. So nothing is too hard for the Lord. Let's go. Have we got time uh, very quickly? Yes, we can. First Chronicles 29. Back to First Chronicles 29. There are obviously hundreds of examples of the Lord doing an amazing array of things, of course. This is um, the time when um, Solomon was instructed to build the temple by uh, uh, David. And you read in uh, uh, 20, verse 29, sorry, chapter 29 and verse 10. Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation, and David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, for ever and ever. Now remember, he's talking before this, and I talked about this at camp in Fresno, that they were offering willingly to the work of the Lord, to the building of the temple, and then we are very much building the temple here, both individually and collectively, the body of Jesus Christ, the temple of the Holy Ghost. And verse 11, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is yours thine is the kingdom o lord and you are exalted at his as head above all both riches and honor come of thee and thou reignest over all and in thine hand is power and might and in thine hand to make great and to give strength unto all now therefore Considering all of that, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. So that's, the, that's always the message, isn't it? We, we stop and we consider and we reflect on the wonderful testimonies, the wonderful talks we've heard, the wonderful encouragement we received, the chatting around together and the building up and the involvement and hope the inspiration that others give us. And we, we, we just know that the Lord has given so many illustrations, examples and parallels and types for us to just absorb. Never ending. We've got a wonderful treasure book here of all the greatness of God. And we can reflect and we give talks on creation and we talk about 10,000 billion, billion stars and we try to compare that to the number of grains of sand on all the seashores of all the countries of the world and we, our mind sort of boggles at this and we don't fully understand, but we know it's something big. So if the Lord can put all that in place, and what is the point of the universe other than for us to say, wow, this is our God. This is our Father. This is the one who loves us, whose eyes are upon us for blessing, who's running to and fro across the face of the earth to show himself strong on behalf of those who are upright and righteous before him. That's the God that we're dealing with. And David reminded the people, well, this is a work you're involved in. At the beginning of this chapter, it says in verse 1 there, Furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation, all the congregation, including us, you might say, Solomon, my son, whom God alone hath chosen, is yet young and tender, and the work is great. We're all involved in this. Solomon was the king, but he, David was saying, King Solomon is, uh, is, is new at all of this. He needs help. Uh, he can't do it alone. 
known there's got to be a team we've got to work together you've got to abide together in the things of the lord the work is great it's exciting to be involved in the things of the lord whether it be in athens or whether it be anywhere around the globe for the palace or the temple is not for man but for the lord god we're doing this not for our own glory our own recognition but because this is a, the wonderful calling that the lord has put us into be so privileged and blessed to be serving the lord whatever it is no matter how menial no matter how uh, perhaps simple the thing might be putting out a few chairs flipping a floor mopping up whatever we're doing is significant as far as the temple is concerned it is all important for the work of the lord of course verse 13 now therefore our god we thank thee and praise thy glorious name that is something we must always be reflecting on that we are a very blessed people to be involved in any of this his power is is unlimited the resources that are available to us are just unimaginable there will come a time when we are translated out of this restrictive life of ours this earthen vessel of ours and we'll we'll get a bigger picture about how this really works at the moment we see through a glass darkly at the moment we're limited but the time coming when we will be no longer limited wow if we had minds like that we'd be blown wouldn't we just last scripture ephesians chapter 3 There are many, many other scriptures, and you can, I'm sure over the period of time, you'll hear them all, nearly all anyway. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, unto him, this is our God, who is able to do, let's believe it, exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works somewhere else in the world no in us that's the power in us it's hard to believe and comprehend but the same power that created the universe is in us the spirit of god moved upon the face of the waters in genesis chapter 1 and verse 2 the spirit moved upon the face of the waters and created ten thousand billion billion stars it may be more than that now that they keep discovering that the universe is even bigger still well it, it, yes it's infinite perhaps in its ways and that same power is in us the same power that created that the same power that raised christ from the dead the same power that performed all the miracles is the same power within us what limits us is our brain our earthen vessel our, our ways our natural carnal ways of course it says that uh, in second corinthians chapter 9 let me read it and god is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work he wants us to be blessed and he wants us to be involved acts 20 from the amplified says and now brethren i commit you to god i deposit you into his charge entrusting you to his protection and to his care and i commend you to the word of his grace to the commands to the counsels and to the promises of his unmerited favor it is able to build you up to give you your rightful inheritance among all god's set apart separated ones those consecrated purified and transformed of soul that's us we got a rightful inheritance not because we deserve it but because jesus christ died for it so verse 21 says unto him be glory in or by the church by jesus christ and in jesus christ whether the word is in or by you can put them both there throughout all ages world without end unto him be the glory and keeping in mind as it says in the amplified bible bible he is able to do infinitely infinitely beyond our highest prayers desires thoughts hopes or dreams he's able to do more than we can think about more than we can comprehend more than we can imagine and he's able to carry out his purpose super abundantly the amplified says he can carry out his purpose super abundantly and all the people said amen, amen.